Welcome back to Edge of Indy. On today's show, I will be joined by two awesome, really successful entrepreneurs here in Indianapolis. One in SAS, that's Cameron Weeks of Sharpen Technologies. The other is ready to bring you a series of great home and garden events. That's Donnell Herber Walton of Suburban Indie Shows. You don't want to miss it. So let's get started today on The Edge. Your audio and video source featuring Indianapolis tech trends, marketing industry champions, and business innovation. This is Edge of Indy. Broadcasting from Edge Media Studios. Let's get today's conversation started. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Edge of Indy. I am still not Aaron Sparks. I am Brittany Simpson, onboarding and outreach manager here at Site Strategics. Uh, Aaron will not be joining us today, so I'm in the driver's seat, so bear with me. It should be a fun ride. I um, want to tell you a little bit about what you can expect from the show, what Edge of Indy is all about. Um, ultimately, we are really focused on uh, local Indianapolis entrepreneurs and innovators, movers and shakers, people out there in our community doing really great things. Um, we feature people and organizations um, helping to make Indianapolis an awesome place to live, work, and visit. And we kind of want to introduce you to... Um, all things local so that you can choose local and choose local often. So that said, I want to introduce our first guest on today's show. Uh, that is Cameron Weeks, co-founder and CEO of Sharpen Technologies. Cameron, Hi. welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us ahead of what is going to be kind of yucky weather in the next couple <laughs> of days, which we'll learn about shortly from Paul Poutit. Yeah, um, glad to be downtown today and not on Friday. Yeah, no, exactly. It's like a max ex exodus <laughs> out of downtown on Friday. Um, welcome to the show. You are CEO over at Sharpen Technologies, um, a cloud native contact center platform that you told me helps people communicate better. Can you tell me a little bit more about Sharpen, what your background is, kind of how it came to be, and, and what you do? Yeah, of course. Um, so Sharpen set out to help companies bring their contact center to the cloud. And when we started the company back in 2011, that was a very new concept. Uh, there's been some very large companies, especially one here in town, Interactive Intelligence, that have been working to help call centers uh, run applications on-premise or in a hosted environment for some time. But as the cloud was developing, contact centers weren't really finding solutions that met their needs in that, se in that segment. Uh, and so Sharpen wanted to build a product that would do that at the enterprise level. And as we really set into that, what we found was it wasn't really the main problem of a customer, of a VP of customer service of getting to the cloud. Their primary problem was this empowerment of their agents and making um, their team more effective and efficient. And as we really boiled it down, that was really the core problem that we found inside the industry that we wanted to find a way to solve. And so while we've helped companies move from on-premise to the cloud, what we've really done is help companies unlock their workforce and make their agents much more efficient and effective in helping solve their customers' problems. Uh, it sounds kind of obvious to a lot of us, but um, you know, companies spend a lot of energy and spend a lot of capital in, in making products and, and systems to make their customers happy and buy more products from them. Uh, and then they put this team of people on the front lines of working through issues. And they a lot of times forget to ensure that those people have the best tools and the best systems in place and then to invest in those, those, that team the most, um, which makes for an odd kind of situation. And so Sharpen uh, is really one of the first companies in our industry to kind of come forward and say, there's a better way to do this from the agent side. And there's a better way to empower these people who really are here wanting to help your company. Um, on the front lines. On the front lines. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Um, taking a step back, can you give maybe viewers and listeners and maybe me um, kind of a better, broader sense of what the Internet of Things actually is? And because that's the area where Sharpen is really differentiated, differentiated themselves, I feel like. Yeah, the Internet of Things poses this really unique opportunity for us in the customer service world in that, you know, proactive customer service has always been the dream. Of how can you for the how can you really reach out and engage the customer before they call you? And where we find value at in the Internet of Things is the ability to receive that data so that we can engage a customer or engage a user before they have to engage us. Um, so we're looking at or traditionally, Internet of Things data has really been used from a diagnostic standpoint from an engineering team level. So if you're Rolls-Royce, um, your engine is spinning off all kinds of data about its performance, and it's going back to your engineering team, and they're reviewing that to enhance the engine and make it more efficient, make mm -hmm. it stronger. Um, but that's not making it, and this is kind of a silly example, because I don't think if you have a Rolls-Royce jet engine, you call a customer service number to say something's not working well. But um, Maybe you do. <laughs> 
yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, if someone's out there to tell us, you know, let us know. <laughs> um, but when you call in, that same data is not available to the person you're reaching. Now, it's available to some part of the company, um, but it's not always been made available to the agents that are actually empowered or, or in a position to solve the problem. So we're wanting to move that data, one, to the agent so they actually can see it in real time that, that they're interfacing with you to solve your problem, but also that we can use that at that event, that notifier, as a reason to reach out to the person to begin with. So that as soon as we start finding an issue, one of our customers start finding an issue in their products, um, that event can be sent into Sharpen, and then we can automatically engage the customer with an agent um, to start solving the problem before they ever have to reach out to us, reach out to the company. Being proactive, I like it. That makes a lot of sense, and yeah, it's it, kind of like preventing further trouble from happening and getting on the front end of things. It makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. But yeah. I'm sure it was harder to come up with than people think, because otherwise it would have been around for a long time. Um, in terms of customer service agents, obviously they have like a rough job. I feel like that's a really hard thing to do. It's an incredibly difficult in job. In terms of like data gathering and data collection to come up with a solution, what were some commonalities that you you saw and heard from these um, agents? Yeah, you know, the first thing we did um, to just kind of validate this idea that it's a hard job it, um because neither of us have this job directly. And I wouldn't um, want it. <laughs> well, we went out to, you know, the, United, the U.S. Labor Department puts together um, these reports every year, and they're actually really powerful pieces of data. And so what we found was that there's kind of three big metrics. Um, one was compensation, um, job complexity, uh, and overall job satisfaction. And, and what we found was that it had the lowest compensation, lowest satisfaction, and highest complexity. Uh, which is the absolute opposite of what you'd want in any career, right? Yeah. And so it also, uh, the end result of that, which is pretty obvious, is it has the highest turnover of any career in the United States. Because of all um, the reasons you just said. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't keep a stressful, um, low-paying okay. job, like the, this, and especially in the country where, where there's so many other opportunities for you. Um, so, so that really is, is kind of the, the primary driving force behind so many issues inside the customer service piece here. Um but what we did, um, what we really found was that these agents, um, the people that, that work in customer service, uh, you know, the, the first thought you could think was that they, they just hate their job and there's nothing you can do about it. And, and that was kind of one of the first concerns. But it actually wasn't true at all. What we found were people who took these jobs really, really enjoyed helping other people solve mm -hmm. problems. That, they really, they, that was their drive in life was to help people solve problems and complex problems. And so it wasn't the fact that they didn't like their job at all and that there were, these people were helpless. It was that they just weren't being empowered to do that. They weren't giving – their systems weren't integrated together to share data or they weren't um, provided with enough systems or access to, to really understand what the problem was and, and to review it and solve it. And so that's what Sharpen's really set out to do, and the cloud really helps us achieve that. And that, in a cloud environment, your the access to other systems like a Salesforce, even or a ticketing system or a proprietary system you've built, just gets much much easier when everything can connect together via API, uh, and data can be shared. When I think about any customer service experience I've had, and you really are only calling customer service when you're mad about something or frustrated, no one calls you're not to calling just say to like, how you're doing. Yeah, like to call and compliment someone. When I think about those experiences, you're up here, you're a nine, you're a 10, you're annoyed. You have to, I imagine, have a high level of um, patience to work in customer service. And I can certainly see how you're when you're not set up for success and you're not given the tools that you need to talk someone down from a level 10 or a level yep. nine, how you're, I mean, you're working against them at that point. They've got nothing to work with. Completely. And when you have no access to simple things like, uh, when someone makes the obvious comment of, I called two days ago for my package. I mean, we just came out of the holiday season. So a lot of people were calling about packages and orders and missing tracking numbers. Um, when that information is not readily available, when, you know, when I call into your company, I expect that you know who I am, that you know all my history, and that it's readily, readily available to the person I'm talking to. And when it's not, we all just become very frustrated. And it's, it is really nice to hear after you had to call a second time for them to say, you know, I, I see here in our records that you did call two days ago. You called around 3 p.m. You talked to camera. Like, it is nice to have that just so you feel like you've been heard because and half just, the time you it, just want to be heard. It's the normal expectation of the world today. And and, and that's the big change that's happened in customer service is that um, the power has shifted. You know, um, make up a random number of years, say five, ten years ago, uh, the power in customer service really lived at the company. And what I mean by that is the company dictated how a consumer or a person was going to speak with them. They published a phone number on their website or an email address and they said, this is how you call us or engage with us. And then Twitter happened. And, and, and the world changed and yeah. companies lost the power overnight and consumers took it and, and they're never going to give it back. And so now it's not the company is no longer gets to decide or successful companies no longer get to decide how they're going to engage with their customer base. Their customer base decides how they're going to engage with them and the company is expected to respond to that. 
So Sharpen is an omni-channel customer service provider tool. We didn't even plan that, and that was like a perfect segue right there. Thank you. We've done this before. (laughs) Can you explain what omni-channel really means and like how it was born? Like how did it come to be? Because it probably is really a good solution given what you just said. Yeah, and it's one of these um, buzzwords that's been around for 20 years. So it's like cloud, right, where um, we just found a better way to market data centers and, and, and data availability. Um, and so Omnichannel is the same thing. People have been talking about Omnichannel inside the contact center for years now. Um, but what's different about it is this migration from multi-channel to truly omni-channel. And the difference here is that multi-channel means that you could call in or email or text message or post on social and that those channels could be accepted into a contact center. What omnichannel really means, though, is the ability that you can start on any one channel and go to any other channel seamlessly. And that's the part that Sharpen does better than anyone else in the market, is that we have no rules on where a conversation can start or where a conversation can end. And we really feel that the technology should get out of the way and not be the burden to the customer service agent. So, you know, I might decide that starting on a text message is the best way to start this conversation. Um, But as you're the agent, you might decide that a text message isn't really the most effective way to solve my complex problem. And so you can easily, in a button click, upgrade our conversation to a phone call. That's awesome. And then when we're done with the phone call, you could downgrade it back to a text message because maybe I, now you don't need me as much. So it's the it's the user, it's the person complain, it's the complainer deciding how they want to interact. Exactly. With you. And, oh. and the technology no longer is in the middle. It, it blends all channels together, and that's the true meaning behind omni-channel. It just is incredibly hard to achieve, and so most vendors in the market hide from that kind of definition of it and, and promote other ways to do it. And, and Sharpen is just completely against this. We we truly believe that um, that you should be able to start on any channel and end on any other channel. Uh, you know, one of the great use cases of this is, is one of our favorite customers. They're down in uh, Columbus, Indiana. It's called Durrell Juvenile. Um, Do you want to give them a shout out? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they uh, they make different products, everything from Costco, uh, COSCO, like step stools in your house, okay. up to um, car seats. And they own several different brands. So one of their brands is Safety First, and they make a, just okay. a giant number of car seats. Uh, and their customer service team uses the Sharpen platform. Mm-hmm. Um, And so being able to have uh, a concerned parent call in uh, asking a question about a car seat and then being able for the parent to walk out to the car with their phone, take a picture of the car seat and send it to the agent, all in band, the same interaction um, has revolutionized the way they can provide customer service and the the speed at which they can solve problems. That's incredible. And gosh, what that's a really good use case, too, because you think about you have to physically go out to your car to take a picture of the car. That's great. And it involves children and safety. And then everyone loves it. Exactly. And then you're saving lives (laughs) and you're doing all kinds of good things. Um, you have a great research document that just came out fairly recently, and it's exposing the true cost of using legacy technology in contact centers. Can you tell us more about what that means? And then we will display not only that, but we can also put the link in the show notes as well so people can pull that up. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it really kind of aligns to this thing we're talking about here of, of Durrell, this kind of use case um, of how and if, when it takes longer to find data, all you're doing is annoying the customer and increasing your cost as a company. And so when you can put more of these things together and you can allow conversations to to seamlessly move between channels from, again, a text message to a phone call to a social post or an email, you can just dramatically reduce the amount of time it takes to solve a problem. And you can get, um, there, there's a KPI in our industry called first call resolution. So the ultimate goal is that when someone calls in for the first time, you can solve that problem right there. And, and unlocking that solves a tremendous amount of uh, value for a company from a customer service score rating over uh, position as well as just a, a true capital outlay. It just costs less money. Say a problem can't be resolved in that first phone call. Say I'm calling you for a solution. I have 15 minutes. I need to get in the car and go pick up my child, whatever. And I need to h- hang up with you. The next time I call you or the next time I text you, does it literally, you, you know exactly where we left off somehow? Um, exactly. But it goes deeper than that, actually. So not only would we know exactly where we left off at, but remember back to this point where we could just move this to a text message now. So while you have to go with on with your day, the problem is still being worked on and you're still concerned with the problem. The problem didn't go away. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just convert this to a channel that is more acceptable for um, for what you're doing in your current day? And so sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but that's the real whole point behind this omni-channel perspective is there is a time that you have to get up from your desk and move on. Or if you ever chatted into a company on their website, this is something that happens to me all the time. Uh, you know, I'll chat in because I have a problem. Um, but by the time the, the problem's not solved yet, but I can't sit at the computer anymore. I have to go do something else. It's time to go home. <laughs> right. So could we move this to a text message or to a phone call um, without having to end that interaction? 
Also in this report, you kind of get to the heart of why ex- um, executives hesitate to move to the cloud in the first place. Can you kind of touch on that? Because I feel like that's kind of a generational thing, um, sort of. It is. It's a, it's a complex problem. And so, um, you know, one of the things we tell all of our new employees, and we, take, we spend a lot of time and we just uh, we repeat this constantly, is that um, Sharpen provides mission-critical services to mission-critical teams. Um, when our when our system doesn't work, it impacts um, lots and lots of people in a very, very bad way. And so whereas some software or some cloud solutions today, you know, if the web page doesn't load, you hit the refresh button and life goes on. Uh, if the contact center is offline, um, people get very, very upset. And it's a very big impact on That's the business. That's when they take it to Twitter. <laughs> yes. Um, and Yelp. And yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Sharpen's pleased to offer the, the highest SLA in our industry with a 5.9 SLA. It's less than five minutes of downtime in a calendar year. Um, and, and that's kind of the that's really the biggest issue that people are having with this migration to the cloud is is just finding solutions for the contact center at least that that are capable of handling their business needs. Um, it also comes from a compliance standpoint. So Sharpen also maintains a, a large number of compliances, uh, compliance certifications, uh, and security requirements. Uh, we have con- we have customers from financial systems to hospitals to defense contractors, uh, and so being able to service that range of a customer base, you know, requires uh, incredibly sophisticated systems and and a lot of compliance adher- uh, adherences. We talked right before the show started about your background. You're an entrepreneur and you have been since age 13. When was your first company? Yeah, yeah. I always say seventh grade because I never remember what age you are at that point okay, in so time. So seventh grade, yeah. you've, been, you've been an entrepreneur since then, um, which is impressive. How many different companies you told me? Uh, three or four maybe. Right, three or four, just a I don't know. <laughs> low-key three or four the, companies, not a big deal. Yeah. Um, so you have an in- interesting, interesting perspective on how companies work. The role of customer service in general, how important – is customer service to literally any company in any industry kind of what is the importance of that in any company? Yeah, you know, we um, we have this old joke that's probably not really funny uh, for how we why we started this company, and it's not really the truth, but um, there <laughs> it's was... It's a lie, but it's it, a good joke. <laughs> no, it's a real story. It really happened. It's just not the reason we started the company. Um, but it was one of the pillars of the company, I guess. And we won't mention names because it's not a good story for the other party. Um, Protect the innocent. But yes. uh, several years ago, there was, I mean, they're still around today, but they were a much larger web hosting company, if you will, or, and domain company um, in the world. And um, we, one of the companies that, that Bracken and I had started was a web hosting and development company. Uh, and we had all of our domain names list- listed with this company. And the company, our client that was having a problem was a large automotive uh, manufacturer. Um, and we hosted one of the websites for them. And the domain wasn't working. There was a DNS issue. And so we're traveling between a meeting and the car, and we call into support to try to figure out uh, what this problem is. And before we ever solve any of the problems, the only thing the person wants to ask me is what my account number is. And so we got in this huge fight over the phone because uh, occasionally I've been known to lose my temper on a phone call when I'm, there's a problem. Um, uh, if it's not my account number, it's your account number that you assigned me. Like, I'll give you one of my numbers, but this one wasn't. Like, right. I, I have no value of this number. It's yours, not mine. And so I think that kind of summarizes this idea of how important is customer service to all of this. And, and that, like, that was the end of that whole relationship um, with that company. And the fact that their customer service agent was in no way, and it wasn't that guy's fault. That, that's the other thing. You know, it was, was just the straw that broke the camel's yeah, back. We, yeah. Well, we always want to blame this agent that, that takes the phone call versus the company that set them up to, to fail. So as consumers, you know, when we call in to do these things, we always get mad at this person. This is a Joe oh, that we call into, right? Guilty as charged. Um, I've gotten nasty to so, some customer service people. Um, so it's really this company's fault. They didn't care enough about their customer service team or their customer service over agenda to to build uh, a system that would actually empower the agent and the customer to solve the problem. Instead, they wanted this uh, obscure number that they had randomly assigned to me three years before that in order to help you in order do to anything. solve a problem. Gosh, dang it! If I haven't been in that scenario, oh my, that's something everybody can resonate with. You yeah, know, it's, having it's terrible. Oh, well, you have every, with that last digit it's not correct we can't help you and you're like a nine it must be a nine then just help me i just need help that's yeah been there for sure um speaking about entrepreneurship here in indiana you are indiana born and raised we talked about obviously this community is booming right now everybody is opening businesses everybody is supporting businesses this is a great time to have a company in indiana can you speak to your experience as an entrepreneur generally speaking and kind of um why you think things are just popping off in Indiana right now. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, uh, you know, great timing for the question, given that the um, governor's state of the state address was last night. And we promised not to make this a political conversation, but um, (laughs) some uh, some really great things happened or some really great things were said. And the fact that um, Governor Holcomb has uh, has pushed that every state in Indiana or every, I'm sorry, every state in Indiana, every school in Indiana will have a computer science program in their high school uh, within the next few years. And I think that is one of the best things that we could do. Um, You know, I've been known for the stump speech of we're forcing kids to learn home ec in high school, whereas whereas that does nothing to provide them a job when they graduate. But if we could teach them programming, they could get a job for starting at $50,000 as soon as they graduate. And so our priorities are wildly out of alignment here. Um, And so your question was just overall entrepreneurship and and technology is not everything, but it is definitely a growing sector it gets of, you there. Our, yeah. <laughs> of our entrepreneurial community here. And so in my high school career, it was very different than that. I mean, there was no computer science. No one thought of putting computer science in high school. And I was incredibly frustrated by this and, and went around multiple different places trying to find a way to learn. And, and at the end of the day, I just had to basically teach myself it uh, until I w- went to Purdue. Um, and so I found that very frustrating, um, but it's incredibly exciting to see just in a few years, and I'm not that old, and, and for me, going from high school to, to college to now, um, the dramatic transformation we've had of putting computer science in high school, right? I mean, um, I don't know, I'm 29, so uh, however many years ago that was in high school, I mean, that, that for a political move like that to happen that quickly is awesome, and I think it really speaks to um, the speed at which things are happening in our community around technology and entrepreneurship. Um, well, and even seeing STEM programs in, in younger schools, younger students getting, getting their hands on technology, I think oh, the sky's the limit now. Now that the doors have been opened and there's all this opportunity, I mean, there's going to be so much growth over time, too. Completely. Cool. Um, okay. So I want to make sure people can get in touch with you and Sharpen. Do you have any parting thoughts before I let you go and before I share all of your social media and website information? Um it's just that um, the agents aren't, when you're talking and you're mad at a company, it's not the agent's fault, Don't it's yell the company's the fault. <laughs> um, these people want to help you. They they live their lives to solve your problem. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes companies haven't made the best investments into helping those people become the most successful. Um, so we're trying to change that and make that a better experience uh, and help companies um, unlock the value and the potential of their of their employees wherever they are in the world. I'm sure all the customer service agents who have Sharpen at their fingertips are like, thank goodness, thank, <laughs> thank you so much, because they're not getting yelled at on a regular basis. Um, you know, not to, um, I won't share any names here, but this is a really cool story that you've kind of alluded to. Um, we recently were just out doing some video testimonials from our, our customers, and we had this really scary idea to, it was terrifying <laughs> to me, um, we put a camera in a conference room, and we let um, we let people walk up to it and just say whatever they wanted to say. And these are the actual agents inside call centers that, that use our product every single day. Yeah. And there was no filter. There was none of our team there present. Um, they could have said anything they wanted about us. So they could have found my name and just cursed me out. Um, luckily, we weren't live streaming it then. We were recording I don't know. It. That sounds fun. Um, but, sounds like a but good opportunity. But what we found was incredible feedback. Feedback. We actually found a lady that, that said that she, you know, she loved the people she worked with. She loved the company that she worked for. But the job and the burden of trying to execute on the job was just so hard that um, it made her want to quit. And when they implemented Sharpen, within six months, it completely changed her view of this whole thing and, and made her love it so much that she actually is going back to school and getting a computer science degree because she wants to actually help people. She wants to be able to do these things to help people um, become better. Like, it, it was the most uh, incredible thing we could have found. So that was a good day for you, though. Very good day. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Keep up the good work because it sounds like you're doing great things for lots of companies, which, again, for all the customer service agents out there, if your company doesn't utilize Sharpen, I would definitely put a word in because <laughs> you definitely want that. Um, in terms of how people can connect with Sharpen, um, you're on Facebook, Sharpen Tech. Website is sharpencx.com, Twitter at sharpentech, and Instagram at sharpentech. So good marketing there. Good good branding across the board. Very well, well we done. We have a great team. Awesome. Cameron, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be in touch for sure. In the meantime, it's time to reconnect with my BFF, Paul Poteet. So let's get back to him. <laughs> real life. Real stories. Let's see what's trending in Indianapolis. This is Paul Poteet. On the Edge. Hi, Paul Poteet. Hi. How are you? How are you? You're all alone today. I am holding down the fort. You're holding down the fort quite nicely. The fort is fortified. It's held. 
Did I do something to offend the other co-host? Um, no, it's not you. It's okay. other things. So, yeah. Plus, I think he just really wants us to be together, you and me. So that's I'm fine. Do twice as many dad jokes. Hang on here. <laughs> Get your bell out. Fully prepared. You know, I also have uh, this. I've never used that, have I? Um, on you? Yeah. Yeah. See, I forget about these things until my grandsons come in here and find like the cowbells. I think we'll be just fine because we dressed alike today. We are very coordinated with our stripes. By the way, monumental marathon cowbell. You know, those people that go, good job, good job, good job. You know, <laughs> it's mile 18 and all you hear is, you know, just a dull roar of death as you're, you know, half walking, half running. But yeah, we are, uh, look at that. And even balanced because most of my stripes are vertical, wherein yours are horizontal. Two words, feng shui. Was that one word with a dash? <laughs> Either way. <laughs> you ready to go on the uh, edge this yes. week? Take me to the edge. This is uh, this made me look twice, and would I guess make you listen twice also? Do you have somebody in your family that is so beloved to you that maybe you would have their voice print tattooed on your body after they were no longer with us? I will say yes, but I don't know that I mean that. Yes. Maybe, maybe, you know, I'm much older than you are. So maybe you should have like one of my segments tattooed. Because <laughs> face it, I mean, I could go, maybe I got five, 10 years left in me. Oh, geez. This Chicago woman's unusual tattoo is not just a visual reminder of her late grandmother, it plays the woman's final voicemail. There's the, uh, the there's the lady. Uh, she tweeted a video, which may be uh, near the bottom of that page, showing the tattoo. It's under her left collarbone, so it's near her heart. And if you scan it with something, I guess like a you know what's the what is a QCR? What are those codes? I should know that. Uh, it's some kind of a you know tech term. QR codes. QR codes. Yeah, I don't know why I wanted to put an extra letter in there, but it's like a QR code and. You can have that apparently tattooed, and so if you scan that over her tattoo of her grandma, it plays the last voicemail message that she got from her grandmother. <laughs> Let me freeze that look. I'm going to have that look that you just made tattooed on me. <laughs> oh, I, that's nice. That's nice. It uses skin motion technology, which allows a user to upload an audio file and have it play whenever the relevant sound wave pattern is scanned with a smartphone or other app-enabled device. So I guess you have to... Hello, Grandma. Hi! <laughs> that is very peculiar. I did not know that technology existed. I don't really know why it does, but... Sure. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can get Mrs. P to have like one of my family leisure commercials. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul, those bring me such happiness. No matter what, I'm, if I'm folding laundry and I can hear it in the other room, I will stop what I'm doing and be like, oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> so when I'm gone, she'll just hold up an after. <laughs> <laughs> the after Christmas sale. If you're <laughs> but it has to be really loud volume, though. It can't be the normal volume. She And then she would remember me at my most energetic. And so I think that would be a beautiful tribute. Well, <laughs> it can be done. If you think something can't be done uh, technology-wise, forget about it. It's been done. It can be done. So you can have your loved one always close to your heart. Who knew? Okay. It's a Mexican tradition to spend the holidays, it says here, binge eating, which would be like our tradition, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you just left it at that. But spend the holidays binge eating tamales. That tradition turned south, if you will, of the border, <laughs> as a Mexican woman was hospitalized for eating 20 tamales oh my. at once. That is excessive, probably. When you get to, yeah, you shouldn't attempt that unless you're, uh, what, Joey, uh, who's the chestnut or what, uh, the guy that is the competitive eater? Ah, always... yes, 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 Joey Chestnut, I believe. Chestnut, right. You hear about him every uh, 4th of July because he pounds those 50 hot dogs. dogs, which also, but, you know, he is a professional 
whatever they call it, endurance eater or whatever. So his stomach is stretched, whatnot. So if you're an amateur, 20 tamales seems like a bridge too far. Speaking of tamales in this story and the grandmother from last story, can I give a special shout out to my sweet granny who turned 97 this week? Did she really? She did. She absolutely did. Good job, granny. And she was the one who told me many, many years ago, you have the face for a camera. You should be on TV. Granny did it. Granny did it. Can you get her saying that on a recording? That you- <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will have to show her this because 90- thanks for television. <laughs> Ninety-seven is a big deal. So, and she loves tamales. I don't know how many tamales she eats at a time, but I've never seen twenty. But she does love her tamales. So if they interview her, because, you know, once you reach a certain age, it's important for a reporter to always ask you, you know, what did you do? Yes. To, everybody wants to know because they want to be 97 also. Would she mention tamales or the key? Oh, I'm sure she would. Absolutely. But 20 of them at one no, time? that's excessive. I've never even had Have you had a tamale? I've not even had one. You know, we used to have, I think I remember having them like out of a can when I was younger. Like you, or the ones that come wrapped in like the little paper and then there would be four of them or five of them in this can. And then you're, uh, you know, it was the seventies. That's my own <laughs> Anything went back then, right? Anything uh, goes. <laughs> of course, you know, my dad would also eat, have you ever seen these, uh, the little Vienna sausages in the can or in the tin, like a little tiny can, never heard of those? No. In some kind of, I've heard of sardines in a can. Yeah, well, my father-in-law would eat those out of a can. Oh boy, uh, and <laughs> be, I would rather have the Vienna sausages uh, myself than the sardines. But they would be in like some kind of very briny <laughs> material, keeping them fresh. <laughs> Almost. So, yeah, d- d- yeah. We have tamales in a can, Vienna sausages in a can. This was <laughs> Prince Albert in a can, then we would let him out. Well, anyway, she had 20 uh, tamales at once, which you shouldn't do in one sitting, because then you'll end up with another sitting. I'm just going to leave it right where you put it. Story number three. Yep. <laughs> from the edge this week uh here's another interesting uh, i kind of bookended this with you know two interesting you know, pieces of tech pet cube is a company called pet cube plans to release a new pet detection technology which is compatible with its pet cube play and pet cube bites devices the feature uses artificial intelligence to recognize pets and let your pet initiate a video like a selfie video oh. that it would send to you i love that or sit, the pet could initiate a video call. And as the headline here says, hang on, guys, Crouton is calling. Oh, Crouton. <laughs> Baxter is calling. I have to take this. Uh, it also lets you fling out treats on the fly as a reward from this mobile app or simply schedule the treats to dispense at regular intervals. They have Facebook Live and Alexa integration, and it allows you to see to, talk to, record video of your pets. Whenever a pet is captured in front of the device's camera, a video recording will automatically be triggered. Then the clip will be pushed to the owner as an app notification. Owners can then accept the video call request from their pet. Oh, it's Baxter, you know. And he's- <laughs> Share it to social platforms or simply view it later on the pet cube. You should invest in this place because uh, I can could, I could totally see this catching on. Oh, yeah. I think that's great. So, on uh, Catterday. Yeah. So, you um, you know, I guess if you had a sick cat or you're monitoring, you know, how much Fido is, is eating or what he's eating, is yeah. he eating? You the know, couch? Pizza? Yeah, the couch or clothing during the day. You could use this new technology, pet cube. Very cool. Oh, I just, like I like it. I mean, why not? He just wants to check in from time to time because he's lonely. I like that. Connect to camera. <laughs> then for the, for the, it seems like it wouldn't be very paw friendly. And do you have to, is it paw print activated? Maybe it could be face activated. But yeah, I guess it would be face activated. Otherwise you have to, you know, hold the, your phone under. Fido. Or bark activated. There are so many opportunities here. Or, yeah, or something else activated. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Some of those androids are waterproof, so that's the important thing. Those are the stories that we found this way. Or, by the way, I guess it would also allow Fido to call you if he'd just eaten 20 tamales. (laughs) 
those are some of the stories that we have found for you this week on the edge. So cool. There. What about the weather? What do you have for us? Because I have, I told you before the segment started, I have lots of questions for you. There will be an area of uh, snow in Indiana, it looks like, uh, that puts down anywhere from three to six, maybe even a, a little more inches on uh, Friday as we you know, come to you with this on Wednesday. Subject to change, your mileage may vary, blah, 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 blah. But uh, right now, the best bet is that it would be somewhere in the southeastern half of the state, like if you have your imaginary mental map right now of Indiana from like up around Angola, northeast Indiana, down to Evansville, to the south, anywhere to the right of that, southeast half of the state is likely where that heavier band is going to be. Look at those temperatures. It's a, today and tomorrow, it's the 50s and boom. We may have a two-part attack actually on Friday. Colder air will arrive in the morning. That should change rain from late Thursday night, possibly to a wintry mix for a little bit in the morning, and then it would change over to snow. And and the heavy snow for the place that sees it is going to be Friday afternoon and especially Friday night, maybe lingering into Saturday. And then oh, look at those temperatures on the other side of that. So we're right back where we started from. Well, I guess we don't go below zero right now, unless we would get a lot of snow because snow only exacerbates the uh, cold then on the other post snow but yeah it's possible that someplace and maybe even in central indiana is going to end up with like a three to six total uh maybe even more especially down to the southeast the uh so you yeah. can confirm mostly maybe I can con well i can confirm that yeah there's going to be uh, more than likely there's going to be a band of heavy snow that but result here in central indiana we probably won't get the nine to twelve that i was seeing last night on the internet Oh, if you look, uh, uh, anybody can do this. Look, just look at weather.com sometime and look at the uh, the, the forecast because it's like the uh, you know the computerized yeah. blender uh, they sometimes call it in the business. It, it you know blends all the available data. And I, I, yeah, when I looked, uh, like uh, I think it was Monday, it was something like ten to twenty inches. <laughs> it's gonna be a giant spread. And then when I looked earlier this morning, I think it was something like one inch all of a sudden for Indianapolis. But so. No, the odds are against us getting a foot of snow. The, the odds for that might be a little bit higher down, closer towards Cincinnati, you know, maybe in the southeast corner of the state. But it's likely, you know, somebody's going to get uh, quite a bit of snow with this. But all data suggests that the heaviest snow will be a little southeast of central Indiana. But we could still, uh, in central Indiana, there could be places, yeah, with three or four enough to, to have to deal with, you know, three. If four. you're wrong, can you? come dig out my car can i dig out your car yes <laughs> <laughs> are minute. you are you willing to do that for me if I your forecast is wrong guaranteeing this stuff <laughs> what <laughs> you want the three degree guarantee or what? i think that was uh, that was brian wilkes bit for a long time the three degree guarantee or something over on 59 you want the three inch <laughs> snow guarantee you want what's the range that you want what's your over under i will accept between one and four. Anything over three starts getting to be, you know, a real pain, you know, and the pain in the driveway, as it were. And uh, so we definitely, I mean, uh, you could be shoveling. My husband could be. I'm not going to be doing it. I know. I know how your system works at home. <laughs> my place, uh, your B, okay? <laughs> Usually it's my name. Neighbor Bob, thank God, with the snowboard. Oh. So I don't even. Bless you, would, uh, bless if you there was Bob. Just, yeah, bless you, neighbor Bob. Uh, or poor Mrs. Poteet sometimes. You know, I'm in here doing feeds to radio stations. She's out there. <laughs> <laughs> just terrible. I just talk about it. All right, you Poteets, hang in there. We'll see what we get. And otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next week. I would have a plan B. I mean, just have it in the back of your mind. Uh, for uh, B, have a plan B on Friday, okay? Everyone have a plan B. <laughs> for a lot of people, it's probably make it Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say that this is Saturday and I won't see your work. But you can get updates on that at paulpoteet.com. As you know, I will be uh, updating the situation. I'll be tweeting you as the snow continues to fall. Yes, I know. You're a, a constant weather companion. Yes, I, I, am. I like to keep you company on the interwebs. <laughs> That's right. Finally, a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Paul. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. Right, see you soon. Bye. 
This is Edge of Indy, showcasing Indianapolis tech trends, marketing industry champions, and business innovation. Broadcasting from Edge Media Studios. Now, let's get back to today's topic. Okay, so you heard it here first. If we get more than four inches of snow, Paul Poteet will dig out my car. And that's what I heard. Everyone else heard that too, right? Excellent. What I want to get to now is a conversation about spring because I don't like the winter or the snow. And I want to talk to and welcome to the show, Donnell Herber Walton, uh, owner and founder of Suburban Indie Shows. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. What are your thoughts on winter? Um, well, I wore sandals in today because it's 45 <laughs> degrees and why not? It so did, those are my thoughts on it winter. It did feel warm yesterday as well. I, I kind of know. went to the gym and left in short sleeves and I was like, this is hot this out. Is okay. It was 38. And I, I thought I like, put the boots in the back of the closet just hoping, <laughs> hoping. Well, let's usher in spring today, let's you and do. me. Um, the Suburban Indie Spring Show yes. is coming up February 8th. 8th through the 11th. Can it you tell is. us about what the event is Absolutely. and what we can look forward to? So it's a four-day event created at, at Grand Park Event Center in Westfield. Great place, by the way. Yes, it is. It's absolutely. It's a brand new facility. If you've not been, you have to go because it is so cool. It's very people, cool. You, you don't even know what it is until, other than this giant, huge building that people drive by. I hear over, yeah. I've driven by it. I've never been in. Well, you need to come in because it's a really cool, cool facility, and I'm glad they have it now. Um, but the the uh, Suburban Indie Home and Outdoor Living Spring Show um, is about bringing spring into uh, into season in February. So uh, we highlight some outdoor living spaces, which are, you know, landscapes, which are 400 square feet, 800 square feet, that kind of thing. Um, got a wine cellar coming in this year for an interior design room, um, a garage set up, some kitchens and things like that. And then we have a marketplace full of uh, vendors selling uh, handmade and homemade products. And then you can talk to anyone uh, about anything as far as remodeling and, and uh, gardening and landscaping and that kind of thing goes. So. It sounds so fun. It is. It sounds right it up is. my alley. It's amazing. Um, at its core, it was designed to really connect homeowners with local businesses to service solutions. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's big with us. It's local, local, local. I'm a local girl. Um, I've lived here for 25 plus years. Love central Indiana. I grew up in southern Indiana in a tiny little town and was brought here. Um, where about? In, where? Um, you know how Indiana is shaped like this? Uh-huh. I'm from here. So just oh, the west toe? of Evansville. It's a little town called Mount Vernon. I know where that is. My you family do? lived in Evansville for a little bit. Yeah, I know where yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's my hometown, and uh, it's where the Wabash and the Ohio meet, and it was a great place to grow up. Population five, 6,000 people. So, um, so I moved here 25 years ago, and shortly after that, I got involved um, with the flower show and the Christmas show at the State Fairgrounds. Um, and then they sold those shows a couple of a couple of years ago. And at that time, Grand Park Event Center was opening, and mm -hmm. the rest is history. So it's what I know. It's what I love. So I wanted to continue doing that. And bringing it to the north side just made perfect sense. And not only is this kind of a walk around and browse kind of event, which, hello, that's always great for getting ideas and, yes. and you know, inspiration and things of that nature. But yeah. there's also going to be kind of events as well, right? You'll be able to see things, demonstrations, things of that, that yes. nature. Yeah, that right? we have. So Belgard is sponsoring um, the stage area. So, yeah, last we had a show in the fall was our inaugural show. And so there was Indiana, um, Indy, Indianapolis organizational um, classes about the, how to organize your garage, how to or organize your closet, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, we'll have landscape contractors talking about helping you with your DIY projects if that's what you choose to do and that type of thing. And then on Sunday, we have Kids Day, which was huge at the fall show. So we're going to have Aww. superheroes and princesses and So it is a kid-friendly thing. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good to know. Um, my favorite part of this, when I saw it, I was like, okay, now I'm definitely going. Um, daily themes and signature drinks. Yes. Can we talk about that, please? We can. And actually, okay. so I sent the email today to the uh, to the guy at the bar. Um, so to our friend, to, the guy at the bar. <laughs> yes, Bob, our best friend at the bar, um, to find out what our daily signature drinks are going to be. Okay. So uh, we'll have a different one every day. Last year, we had um, cute cute names for for the drinks but they're like eight dollars so they're really affordable and you can walk around with your drink absolutely and do your home improvement yeah shop. yeah that's you know that's... i need to go right now i'm sorry is it february 8th yet <laughs> well we could go do some taste testing i'm guessing Wait, well bob needs our help <laughs> yes he does he does so that's one of the cool things about grand park too a lot of people don't know it's a two-story facility mm -hmm. so on the second story is a restaurant and a bar and it overlooks the show floor so it's really cool oh, that's so fun. i can spy on people 
so I can that's there one thing see. you could do yes <laughs> but as a show producer it's important for me to be able to go up and look and see what the traffic flow yep. is of the crowd so if an exhibitor comes to me and says hey listen nobody's coming to my booth I can go look and see okay if they really are or if they're not so uh-huh. yeah so it's, so it's kind like of nice big, troubleshooting big sister sitting at the bar <laughs> troubleshooting <laughs> love it yes um, you're expecting over 200 exhibitors right that's yes enormous yeah. by the way it, it is you know what it is a lot of exhibitors but we have about 100,000 square feet um, it's so a it's huge not, place it is a huge space well there's 375,000 square feet in the entire event center and um, as you may know or probably know yes. it's actually soccer it's a soccer mm-hmm. complex mm-hmm. so there's three huge soccer fields um, when I signed a five-year contract they agreed to invest in a um, industrial composite flooring system that goes down over the middle field mm-hmm. so that's the field that we use um, for the events so, yeah, so it's not so big that you can't see it all in a couple hours because I understand people's time is very sure. valuable. But it's this... not like a 10-minute walk through. No, you absolutely not. You need to commit not. a good chunk no, of your especially day. with a lot of the shopping that, that well, you can do, Especially with the day drinking that you could be doing yes. as well. You and need... we open at 10, so there's nothing wrong with that. That's how I like to start yeah. my weekend mornings. <laughs> Or a Tuesday. <laughs> or a Tuesday or <laughs> whatever life allows for sure. I asked you before if you'd be willing to shout out some of the exhibitors. We won't say they're your favorites. Do any come to mind or are you excited about any or do you think people who attend well, will be excited about anyone you want to yes. give a shout out to? Well, with the outdoor living spaces are always the most popular because it is as if your backyard is right there waiting for you. Um, so Vive Outdoor Designs have, has been, or Exterior Designs, Ryan Coyle has been a great supporter of mine over the years. Um, the Stone Center, which now has a location like a half a mile from Grand Park. Um, there are other ones here in Indianapolis. Um, they're always a great partner. Bellegarde, Hardscapes. Um, again, Central Indiana Chevy Dealers is the sponsor of all of my shows. Um, and I love Mike dearly, and they're, it's just been amazing to see the sponsors that I had who supported me over the years at my shows at the fairgrounds have just picked Followed up and moved you. with me to the to North, which is what you hope happens, yeah. and people promise you they'll be there for you, but you don't know until it happens, and it's been actually, it's it's been overwhelming sometimes for me just to, oh. just to see um, how much support that I get. Well, it's because you're so nice. Yeah. Well, I people hope so. People would be silly not so. to follow you. I, I want to follow you out of here, too. Um, it's also pretty cool because you'll have uh, media personalities there from Fox 59 and CBS 4, too, which yes. I think is always nice. I don't know if I'm the exception to me because I am part of the media, Maybe. but I always like meeting them and like knowing they're you welcome them into your they're home people, every, day. every day so why not meet them and yeah so say I'm, hi? I'm always excited to see them because i do wake up with fox 59 every morning so it's like they're my people yeah and now that i work from home they really are the only people <laughs> i speak to in the morning so <laughs> so you speak to your tv in the yes morning. <laughs> i do so yeah so fox 59 and cbs4 are our media partners um and they've been absolutely wonderful to work with too that's awesome Let's talk about ticket prices. So yes. tickets at the gate are going to be $10. Right. But if they're pre-purchased online, you can buy one, get one free. So this is kind of yes. an absolute no-brainer. We have it pulled up on the screen where you can go, and we'll also share the link in the show Very notes nice. as well. Um, that's a great price, especially for the amount of exhibitors you're going yes. to have there. Yes, yes, it is. And it's just it, – We're introducing new events to the north side, and we understand that. And we are just trying to make it as easy um, on people to be able to come and visit our show. So $5, buy one, get one with a $5 fee seems pretty, pretty reasonable. And there's free parking. That's, so there's no additional charge for parking, which is nice which too. Which is kind of unheard of yes. anymore. And there and the parking lot's right in front of the Yeah, it's you know, easy. Right in front it's of the easy building. parking. It's so easy. Very good. Um so Suburban Indie Shows is a locally owned small business, aims at um Yeah, it's just me. It's just I mean <laughs> it's, it's just it's me one person small. right now. Um as an entrepreneur, what is your advice for other people in Indiana who might want to start up their own their own business? Oh my gosh. Well, um, if you are doing something currently that you love to do and you are passionate about, why not? Why not take it? I mean, I was for 17 years, I produced events for other people. Um, and luckily, they were retired and lived in Florida and let me run their company for them. So therefore, I learned how mm-hmm. to run the shows, the events, the company. Um, and so when the events were sold, um, there was a little, I don't know, I guess, a little panic but then, you know, a week later, I find out this event center in Westfield is open. I thought, oh, guess I know what I'm going to do now. Yeah. So Talk about perfect timing. Tech, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I have lucked into most of the things in my life, honestly. And I think it's just because when you follow your passion, that, that tends to happen. 
when you love doing what you do, you just keep doing it. And, and you find ways to do it. And because you're a lucky middle child that we talked I about. am a lucky middle <laughs> child. <laughs> um, what kind of support are you looking for from the community other than people coming to the event itself? What can well, people, think, like, what can we do to help process well, I think people event? obviously coming to see the show, mm-hmm. feedback is so important because, you know, not only do I have the spring show in February, but then I have the fall show again in September. I have a holiday show um, in November, and then next March we'll be launching a women's show. So if anyone has any other ideas, and, and those are the shows I produce because I'm passionate about those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that I'd be good at producing like a golf show because, you know, no, I, God, boring. I don't like the golf, <laughs> but I do like to drive the cart and drink. So see, we are so kindred spirits. I know, spirits. I know. So, so if you need someone to drive yes. your golf cart and drink, you can yes. get in touch with both of us. Well, and then come to the show and do business locally. Do yeah. business with the local companies who have been here for ever and will continue to be here as long as they get support. Well, and that's something we talk about every week on this show is do you want to support a big company who doesn't know your face, doesn't know your name, couldn't name your daughter, couldn't name your son, or do you want to do business with a company that you know every dollar that you give them will feed their children, will go into their children's education, stay locally and will support. I mean, it's everyone needs to be supporting local. Well, and when you when you go to these shows, you get to meet the business yes. owner, and you get to meet them face to face. And if if it clicks great, if it doesn't, then there's another guy or then gal you can talk walk to. Walk to the next section again. But it's but it's so important <laughs> yeah. to have that connection because you want to be able to trust and believe and know. Um, people like doing business with people they like. Yep, and people that they know. It's kind of like speed dating so, for yes. People. Oh you my gosh, do I did that with. once. That was not a success. But anyway, <laughs> that's a, a story for some drinks yes. another day. Oh, that's us and our drinks. So funny. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, what would you want to say to anyone who hasn't already secured their tickets or why should people secure their tickets? Um, well, I don't know that it's an immediate that you need to secure your tickets other than that, that way you can put it on your calendar to make sure you're coming because we will not run out of tickets. I promise. I will not let that happen. You will not turn people away? I will not turn people away. <laughs> Absolutely not. Fire marshal might if it gets too full, what but is, I would what never. What is the fire amount that we're allowed to have <laughs> I in think the it's I think it's 10,000 a day, 10,000 people. So I think we're safe. Okay. Well. I think we're safe. It's my mission to just go right right up to that limit. Get yes. that many people there for you. Yes. It sounds I appreciate fun. It. I will be there for sure. I think it sounds awesome. Thank you. So. I will be there all day, every day. I, for up above so watching, make sure, I know you make will sure be. You, say, you stop and say hi if you come. <laughs> You're going to be watching from above. Yes, come join me at the bar, <laughs> or I call it my upstairs office. It's just another location. I love it. I love it so, exactly. It's the office from above. That's right. Donnell, thank you so much. Thank you. I very look forward much. to it. Let's make sure people can connect. It's suburbanindieshows dot com slash spring for the spring show. Right. Um, at Twitter, it's at Urb, um, suburban indie. Facebook, suburban indie shows, and Instagram, suburban indie shows. And make sure you spell suburban right. It's a tough word to spell. It is kind of. It's strict because you think you think you know how to spell it, and then you're like, no, <laughs> there there is an R. There is there is no R after the first U. But there is that first R. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we'll help you. It's on the screen, everyone. You. you don't need to think that hard. <laughs> um, again, Donnell, thank you so much. Thank it should you be for a great event. Me. That is all from us today at Edge of Indie. We'll be back next week with more guests and more fun and more Paul Poteet. And I hope it doesn't snow more than four inches. And exactly. <laughs> Let's do our anti right. anti snow dance because I can't do it. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next week and we will see you back on the edge. Bye bye. <laughs>